I got money on my mind. I'm just trying to get some dough. I ain't picking up my lot unless it's money on the phone. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Black Wolf Renaissance Podcast. Your boy, David Bellar, one-fourth of the Black Wolf Renaissance, checking in with my co-host, Jalen. How you feeling, bro? What's good? What's good? What's good? It's your boy, Jalen, man. Another quarter of the Black Wolf Renaissance Podcast. I'm feeling great, man. Uh, it's just me and my boy, David, in the uh, lab today. Hey. Uh, our other two brothers, they at work right now, but uh, we're going to keep the show rolling, man. Oh, and I'm so excited about this podcast today, bro. Man, well, man been this brother got the bro, industry, man. man his content just be so fire but but before we get into all of that look we're going to ask y'all please wait review comment subscribe like the podcast share it if you're a new listener welcome if you've been a part of the wealth builders hey thank you for coming back let's get on into it yes indeed uh like my brother Jalen was saying we got another dope episode planned for y'all today we this is an anticipated mm. one on our end this is a brother we a fan of personally uh He's made. He's been able to amass a million streams on Spotify independently. Chopped out number three on the iTunes chart in hip hop. Been number one in France for forty seven days. Like man, my brother doing the damn thing, and it's all independent. He's been teaching people about this music game. We have none other than our brother Dorian from Group Eighty Two Media. Dorian, how you living, bro? What's up with y'all, man? Appreciate y'all having me on. Appreciate the intro. I like the sound effects and everything. Y'all, y'all official over here. Yeah, hey, man. Hey, man. Like we said, man, some inspiration. So we was like, man, we got to go a little bit harder, man. <laughs> <laughs> Hell no. Uh, yeah, man. Appreciate that, man. Appreciate the intro. Thank you for everything. Thank you for having me. Glad that you could come on today and uh, just, just share with our audience for sure. So, Dorian, bro, we're going to hop into this the same way we hop into every podcast, my dog. We want to just start with your journey. So like, can you, can we ask you like, what was the beginning of the, the, your whole music journey, honestly? Yeah. So mine's a little bit different, man. Um, like, so, you know, with us in our, in our culture, like music, we, we in the womb, like music, just a part of everything that we do. And my parents, they were from Dayton, Ohio. So they grew up in the funk era. So mm. like George Clinton parliament, uh, like, um, Lakeside, all of them, Boosie Collins songs, listen to all that stuff when I was really young. And then I was born in 84, so I'm 36. And so when I was like eight or nine, that's when Death Row got massive. So the whole G-Funk was a derivative of their funk. My parents ain't really like it, but they like the beats because mm -hmm. I mean, beats are amazing. And so that was my like introduction into my own music. And so but being in Dayton and then moving to Indianapolis, Indiana when I was in sixth grade, Make it into music, just not like a real thing, especially rap. Because if y'all remember at that time, rap was demonized like the worst thing ever to ever. happen in America. Like rap was worse than slavery. Like and Geraldo said some shit like that. Kendrick had on his album. But so like it's it's like, man, it's not real. And so fast forward high school, college, like I'm not thinking about music. I decided I want to be a basketball coach. I really love the game of basketball. And I go through my whole basketball career, like high school coach, coach in Mount Verde Academy down in Orlando. Um, I coached at VCU under Shaka Smart, coach at Jacksonville University, coach AAU, did all this stuff, worked in the NBA for a little bit. And then I, it got to the point with me when I was 29, my whole 20s, I had been working for somebody else. Mm. And I had no control over my life. And in my 20s, man, I moved probably like 11 times chasing basketball jobs. And so I was like, man, I want to take control. But what can I do? Like, I'm broke. I don't know nobody. Like, I still got to work for somebody. So what am I going to do? So I really started studying millionaires and billionaires. And I went to the Forbes list. Literally, this went down. And I saw the ones that were self-made, right? Can we go to that list? Like, it doesn't look like it does now with Bezos at the top and, and Elon and Bill mm -hmm. Gates. Like, Bill Gates is there, but not really at the time. Um, you had a lot of, like, Waltons. Like, and anybody don't know, when you go to the Forbes list, you see Waltons. That's Walmart. Mm -hmm. Ain't none of them did nothing. Sam Walton did that. He died, mm -hmm. left them, like, $25 billion a piece. And so I'm like, all right, that ain't me. And I started looking at the black people. And at the time, it was Oprah. And I think Robert Johnson was about to get his divorce. So he was barely on there. I'm like, damn. So then I had to scale down to like the center millionaires. So people that's nine figures. And so I started looking at like Dre and Puffy and Russell and Michael Jordan and Tigers like sports entertainment. And I already did sports, always could write, um, play drums and trumpet when I was in elementary school, sang in a church choir, did all that. And so I always had music in me. But like I said, being from the Midwest, it's not a real thing. And so I was like, man, you know what? 
I'm about to teach myself how to make beats like everybody else. Fuck it. And so uh, I actually watched a rich homie Quan interview and he was talking about how when he got out, he literally bought himself a MacBook Pro, bought himself Pro Tools. He taught himself how to make beats, made his mixtapes, some type of way was on there and his life got changed. I got a master's degree from University of Central Florida. I was like, if his ass can figure it out, <laughs> I can figure this out. Shout out to rich homie Quan for the inspiration. And so once that happened, I just really, really, really started studying the game. And there's so many free music business courses. There's one on edX.org. Uh, it was taught by John Kellogg, and I'm shouting him out. He's a, he's a brother. He was really, really nice to me. Like, he always responds to my emails and stuff. So that was a really good class. I just started just researching everything I could about the music business and dropped my first album. It was awful because I didn't know what I was doing. And then, like, six, seven months later, I made my second album. It was, it was better, better engineering, better beats and stuff. And then I wasn't getting any attention. I'm like, okay. I'm making music. People say like it. Why is it not working? Like the magic touch, like Rich Homie Quan said, he made some type of way it went off. And so I had to learn marketing. I had to learn social media marketing. So this is 2015. So I'm looking at Facebook, Google Plus, Instagram a little bit, YouTube a little bit. And not in like any of them platforms, because contrary to popular belief, I'm not a big social media dude. I don't really like mm -hmm. it. And so there's a platform out called Periscope, which is new. And you went live and you talked directly to the audience, kind of like how we doing right here. And I liked that a lot better. So I went on Periscope and I started scoping and going live every single day. And I built my following on there. Like I went from zero to like 24,000 followers. And on that app like Periscope, Eesh. that's probably the equivalent of probably having 300,000 on Instagram right now. And so I was able to really make a dent in there. But when you're going live, you got to keep them entertained. Man, people would stay on my scopes for one, two, three hours sometimes, like Damn. the whole time. So I learned how to keep them there. I learned how to engage with them. I learned how to respond to questions or read comments and look up stuff. So I learned, I really developed a close relationship with my fans that I call The Pond. And so Twitter on Periscope, they tricked it off. I was like, Damn. Like I built up this whole following and like, this ain't go, it's about to all go away. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, well, let me go over to Instagram. Then once I went over to Instagram, that's when I really started like building. That's when things kind of popped off for me. And I was able to integrate the music business stuff with all my content. And that's kind of how my music career kind of got started. Hey man, that's a, a that's, beautiful yeah. intro to, to you and your story. And Real quick, man, before I know my brother Jalen probably got some questions. I got to talk on it because this is one of my favorite parts about your YouTube channel. The idea of the pond. Yeah, man. Like, how did you come up with my that? Ducks. I love it. Man, I shout. These these are my brothers, man. I've shouted about so many interviews. I said I would, but I'm going to have to keep doing it because I'm part of it. So my brothers, Marshall McFadden and Sean Dickerson, they're both firemen back home in Indianapolis. When we were 14, uh, we were hooping on my homeboy John Strong's court. And um, I was killing, I was eating them. And like, they didn't know my name at the at the time, but they said I look like Kevin Duckworth. And I don't know if y'all know who he is, he played in the NBA. So they said I look like Kevin Duckworth. If y'all Google the picture, I look nothing like this dude. <laughs> and so, they started, so they started calling me Duckworth. And in my high school, I went to North Central High School, it was 3,000 students. So then they started calling me Duck. And it was just one of them nicknames. You know when you have a nickname that it sticks. Becomes, yeah, 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 exactly. And so in high school, I was ducked. And then one of my homeboys, James Bigsby, he went to college with me. And Biggs is a really loud, typical nap town dude. So he only knew me as Duck. So when I got to IU, everybody knew me as Duck. They didn't know my name like that. And when I was coming up with stuff for music, I started studying brands like Drake got the OVO Al. Uh, for the longest, Jake, Jake Cole's thing was like angel and the, and the mm -hmm. devil. If you look at the early J. Cole mm -hmm. logo, had the halo, had the horns, you know, and then even Nikki, Barbies, and everybody had something. And I was like, man, my nickname's Duck. Let me start studying the duck. The duck is the only animal in the animal kingdom that can walk on land, swim in water, and fly in the air. It can adapt to any terrain. I didn't know that. So I was like, mm -hmm. damn, that's, that's actually kind of cool. And I was like, okay, I'm duck. That's the males, like female fans. Swans are prettier than ducks. So we got ducks and swans. And then we have our community, pond. That shit rhymes. My ducks, my swans, welcome to the pond. 
Hey. <laughs> hey, man, it's so pressure, though, and I like how you came up with it and, like, that it actually played into your personality, but also that you went you went ahead and you looked into it because I'm really big on, like, symbol, symbol, uh, symbolization Symbolism. and stuff like that. Yeah. So, like, the way that you actually went look into it, even, like, deeper with the duck, though, like, we know what happens whenever a duck is on top of the water, mm-hmm. but... The what goes on under the water is what people don't realize. Mm-hmm. So I kind of want to talk about that with you and your music career. Did did that was there some symbolism with that also? That's a great question. Hell yeah, man. Like the whole music industry is that. All we see is everybody above water. Mm. But up underwater, it ain't just the feet paddling. It's sharks come at their feet. They got the damn coke plastic thing on the ducks. Mm. I don't even know what they ain't called paws, whatever they call. <laughs> <laughs> they <little> flappers. flappers. <laughs> what well, yeah, flappers. <laughs> so like they got all that going on, man. It's like that is the music industry and that was a problem for me because I had a job at that time when I was 29, probably the worst job I ever had. But the great thing about this job, I worked nights. I worked from 11 a.m. 11 p.m. to 8 a.m. And it was a stat a company called Stats. And what we did, we, we analyzed the data for the NBA, which sounds cool, but it was awful. So we would have one game where we got to analyze the data. Then another screen was the game that was coming up next. Then on the third screen, we could watch whatever we wanted or listen to whatever we wanted. Now I watched so many YouTube interviews, man. And so I watched every single artist talk about the music industry, trying to plug like, okay, how did you go from sleeping in your car up under a bridge to producing with Kanye and Jay-Z. Like, y'all are leaving out steps. Mm -hmm. And I'm reading the Wikipedia and I'm reading the interviews. I'm like, what the hell? And it starts making artists think that maybe I'm just not good enough. Maybe I'm just not the person that needs to get chose. But what happens is a lot of these dudes and girls don't know their deals. They don't own nothing. And they can't talk about nothing because they don't know how it happened for themselves, right? Like, most of these dudes, the way that they got a deal back then was they might have had a friend that was a manager or something, and they might start doing showcases or somebody's relationship might have got them with this A&R, and that A&R liked the song, and the A&R brought it to the VP of A&R that they brought to the president of the label, and they offered you a deal where they own everything. So nobody wants to admit that my advance was $15,000, and I don't own nothing. So when mm-hmm. I come into the interview, I want to look like the duck above the pond. But mm-hmm. below the pond, it's terrible. Like, and that's why I had to piece all this stuff together. Then once I did, I'm like, Man, this whole industry is a joke. Like, we don't own shit. It's, it's almost sad. I was talking to my lady about this the other day. It's almost sad, man. It makes me not love songs I grew up with as mm-hmm. much because you realize these people don't even own that stuff. Bro, mm. bro. Whenever, you, like, watching your YouTube channel, honestly, has helped me truly internalize that idea and, like, I'm glad you bring that up because when it comes to this industry shit, like I wanted to, I want to go deeper with, with your journey. Like, so you, you started learning about this marketing from like rich homie Quan and stuff. So what was the beginning of it for you? Like, what was your first steps on social media? So the first step was me and I didn't even know I was doing this, but when I was on Periscope, I was consistent. I was post, I was going live every single day for at least an hour, every single day. And then on Periscope, what I was doing is I was in, engaging. Once again, I didn't know I, I didn't know the terms at the time. I was just being mm-hmm. me. And so people would write comments. I would read the comments. They would ask a question. I would answer it. And that made people stick around because I was mm-hmm. actually engaging. Too many people get on social media. And I talked about this on X's podcast, The Millionaire My Mindset, where uh, he calls it the Beyonce effect. They think they're mm-hmm. Beyonce. Yep. Yeah, ain't nobody coming on social media to look at you. You need to talk to somebody. Don't nobody know who you are. You got 42 followers. Have a conversation, man. It's it's three of us in here. Like, talk. You know, so that's what I started doing. I was engaging. I was consistent. And then I listened, right? Like, if they didn't like the sound or something was off or, Dwayne, have you thought about doing this? Or have you thought about running a contest for this or whatever? I would try stuff and see what worked. And so once I started trying things, I developed my own plan, like, one thing we did, we called the SoundCloud Showcase. So what we would do is every Sunday at 2 p.m., we would have people come in like, hey, we're going to play anybody music that's on SoundCloud. First 20 people come in. We're going to write you down. We're going to play your music. I'm going to give my feedback. People going to vote if they like it or not. If people like it, we're going to add you to a playlist on SoundCloud. 
but you got to share it. You got to like it. You got to bring people in there. So every Sunday on Periscope, my account was on fire. Mm-hmm. Like, cause it's getting shares, it's getting likes, it's getting taps, it's getting a bunch of people coming in. So every Monday I will wake up and I'll be trending on Periscope. I'm behind Steve Harvey. I'm behind Justin Timberlake. Like I'm trending on that list, That's which got cool. me more followers. Once again, I didn't know th- these terms. I didn't know I was bringing all this engagement, which was kicking the algorithm stuff I didn't know. So Periscope was my training ground. It's my boot camp. And I'm almost depressed and in mourning because they about to get rid of Periscope. This this is January 2021. In about three months, Periscope is going to be gone because Twitter is getting rid of it. But I took all that to Instagram. So everything I learned, I took it to Instagram. I just had to learn how to make videos that fit me because I couldn't Instagram live sucks. It is mm-hmm. what it is. It's yeah, awful. real shit. It really does. So, and at the time when I came over to Instagram, they had just introduced 60 second videos. So I had to make everything. I'm used to being a long form content person like how y'all are. Mm-hmm. I had to make it 60 seconds, right? Then they introduced IGTV and that really opened up a lot of stuff for me. I learned the ins and outs of Instagram, Instagram ads and all that. And then somebody, this is really how YouTube happened for me. One of my, somebody who was in the pond said, man, I love your content, but Instagram search feature sucks. I can't find none of your videos that I want. Can you just post them up on YouTube? I was like, cool. So I just started putting them on YouTube, not even thinking about them. Man, I posted probably nine videos. And the first video that really did some was uh, 50 Cent's friends switched up on Mm -hmm. him after his first paycheck. And then that one, like, cause I, at the time I had like 800 subscribers on YouTube or something. So I still had all the notifications coming to my phone. I wanted to respond to the comments and engage what Periscope had taught me to do. But then one day I got like 50 comments. I'm like, the hell? Like, I, need, I need to turn this off. I got stuff to do. You know what I mean? So I, and I saw, okay, man, that video's picking up. And then two days later, I posted Jay-Z warning the entire Rockefeller roster about 50 cent. That video got a million views in like three weeks. And it's crazy. changed everything. Because anybody knows anything about YouTube partner program, which is how you monetize. You got to have a thousand subscribers and 4,000 watch hours and no copyright strikes. I think at the time, and I probably had maybe 1,300 watch hours with that Jay-Z video. I got that done in like 48 hours. Like it just, it just changed everything. So I applied for the partner program. I'm like, oh shit, I'm getting paid. And that just became how I started doing everything on YouTube and Instagram. Hey man, that's that's a dope ass story, my brother. <laughs> and I kind of want to ask you because I'm interested in that that part with Periscope because this is something that we talk about a lot to our followers is that whenever you're on these social platforms, you don't own your following. Mm. You don't own that. And I kind of want to talk about the way you were able to pivot and take notice of that, but how did you internalize that and say, okay, moving forward now, I need to own mm-hmm. these followers. Did you kind of internalize it? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad that you brought that up because when I was reading and researching about music marketing at that time, email list, everybody kept talking about email list, email list. Email. So, I, so on Periscope, I'm glad you said that. I kept telling people, go to my website and join my email list. Now at the time I wasn't offering them nothing. I was saying, hey, just go get on my email mm-hmm. list so you can stay in touch with me. With me. But now I offer a free ebook how to get 1 million streams on Spotify. So you go to group A2music.com, you get the free ebook, you put your email list, email in, so now you're on my email list. So because I was already thinking that, I was able to pivot. Now, I did lose a lot of followers. Like that whole 22,000 didn't come over to me on Instagram. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people who were on Periscope, they weren't Instagram fans. That's another thing mm-hmm. we got to understand about social media. Each platform is different with a different personality. And so a lot of people weren't Instagram because remember when Instagram at that time was pictures, money, filters, Foodies who look good. That shit. Yeah. And like we wasn't into that. And like my content on Periscope at the time was almost the antithesis of that. It was mm. more about engaging and having a real conversation. And so my Instagram strategy sucked at first. But from the very beginning, I made sure, OK, we need to have an ebook so we can build this email list out. And that really helped me too, because now I'm engaging with them in a whole nother medium. And now I own that email list. And I think we almost have like 20 or 25,000 emails now, which is something I can always own. Hey, I love it, man. I love it. And I love that you were able to, you know, like you said, you didn't even know what you was doing, but you still had took that action. You took the action. And 
I think that's that's something that's really important for every entrepreneur, every entrepreneur, everyone who who really makes it is sometimes we don't know exactly what we're doing, but we know that this is working. So let me keep on doing it. And I think that's whenever you know you're actually walking in your purpose. I think that's how you know you're actually doing what you need to be doing. Because even sometimes where you don't know exactly what's going on, what you're doing is working for you. That's what I tell people, man. Like, and uh, Rashad Bilal, he said this on y'all episode, one of the best quotes I've heard about growing social media. He said, growing social media is like having a part-time job for two years and not getting paid. Man, that, hey, that's it. hey man, that shit stuck with me for real. For that's, real though. That's that's, and that's how we were feeling. Like he hit the nail on the head on the nail and we didn't even, it prepared us for what was about to come because even with like our page, we grew like super we fast grew on super social. fast on yeah. Instagram and like it just took off. But a lot of people didn't see the work that was going into creating this type of content, finding out what's going to hit. Like you said, actually learning Instagram's platform. Oh, oh, they're rewarding people for IGTVs right yeah. now. So we're going to use a lot more of that. And oh, right now they're using reels. Let's use more of that. A lot of people don't understand that. I still see some people posting content that should be posted as reels as a regular video whenever they don't realize, hey, this is the this is what the system is rewarding warning you mm-hmm. for right now. now and even with that that two year piece I think that's really major because just even with your story you were saying like people look at everything you're doing on YouTube Instagram and all that stuff now and think oh man this shit happened overnight but you said three years ago you was on Periscope and people who was on Instagram weren't even aware that you was on Periscope but you figured it out yep it's it's those fundamentals man and that goes back to what I was about to say like you know if you put yourself in that mentality like like Shadi said you are prepared to learn the fundamentals. It's like hooping, right? Like it don't matter where, what court you're on, who's your coaches, who's your teammates. If you know how to dribble, you know how to dribble. If you got great court vision, you got great court vision. If you know how to shoot, it don't matter what court Steph Curry's on. He is going to put his elbow and hand placement the exact same way Mm -hmm. that his daddy taught him when he was four years old because he has the fundamentals. It's the same with social media. Like every platform is different, but you got to learn the social, you got to learn the fundamentals, which is hard work and you got to be consistent. And like you just said with, those features anytime any of these social media platforms roll out a feature i use because because mm-hmm. they want to see if the feature works so they're going to prepare you like right now if you're on instagram they haven't offered it to anybody they're offering badges so what that is is if you go live you can turn on badges you can get paid so if you have that you need to do that and what instagram is offering i don't know how long are they going to do this any dollar you get, they match. Like they on some 401k Fuck shit. Motherfucker. What? They yeah. didn't even give it to <laughs> us. <laughs> Bitches. I need them to run me that bad. <laughs> hey, D- dude, I don't know who y'all know, but y'all got to hit them up because they gave it to me like ASAP. They matching and they ain't taking no cut. You know, you two take 30%. Right now, Instagram's let you keep 100 and they matching you. So Damn. that's why I've been going live so much on IG. It's like, yo, badges on. Pay me. Damn. I mean, so... Like anytime there's there's a new feature, you need to use that shit. I think there's some on Instagram right now called Spotlight and like guides and like or maybe even at Snapchat. But I know guides on Instagram. I haven't used that yet. But for anybody that's trying to get their account to grow and get more attention, go check that out too, man. Go use those new features because that's what they reward. I definitely see that shit at yeah, the bottom I, right now. What I the see, fuck? I seen guides. I never really looked into it though. Hey, that's hey, my brother. You you preaching the gospel right now when it comes to the social media stuff. And I not with that, I kind of even want to go back into the music piece because I we, you was getting on some stuff that I know we wanted to touch mm-hmm. on <laughs> that we uh we we kind of diverted from. Uh, so like with this music industry shit, man, what made you come to the realization like after you did all your digging that like I'm gonna go this independent route? Man, you know what? It's it's so much deeper than what we see. Like. You know, I've been doing this music business shit for like seven years, man. I just found out last night that in the mid '90s, <clears throat> Seagram's, the liquor company, Seagram's, the liquor distillery company that mm-hmm. we saw everywhere when we were little before we could even drink, they owned Interscope Records. What? When you when you and when you follow the money trail, and that's why I tell people y'all need to turn off ESPN sometimes, turn on CNBC. 
Mm. You see who owns what. Everybody talk about Illuminati, Illuminati. They, y'all make the Illuminati law some like ghost puppet shit. That's not real. What's real is these people who have old money, they have their hands in on everything. Mm. And in the music business, man, it's everywhere. And so it got to the point with me where like, I was learning about the industry, so I didn't want any of those BS deals. Like, I got to own my masters, right? So they don't want to really mess with anybody who wants to do that. I'm not signing no 360 deal. I'm not giving up my publishing. As I started learning all these things, it didn't make sense. So based on my brand, it wasn't that strong at that time. And what I wanted, I wasn't really having great conversations with people who were at labels. So I was like, okay, I got to be an independent artist. Once I learned how to do this on my own, and once I seen artists like, Nick Grant, like Rory, like Tink, like John Connor, who are all for dope artists. Mm -hmm. And they labels ain't doing nothing for them after they get on the front cover of Double XL Freshman List and all that. I'm like, y'all own they stuff and you just got them on the shelf. Mm -hmm. And then I dug deeper and I'm like, Seagram's own Interscope, this dude who's an investor in Warner Music also gave money to his politician in Wisconsin who is for for-profit prisons at a time when Jacob Blake got shot. Like when you follow the money, it's like y'all are literally using our masters to control us and fuck us up. Hmm. Why would I sign to a label? Why would I do that? Why would I put money in y'all pocket to continue to finance the destruction of black people? Hmm. And, you know, and for a lot of artists, this is, this is a lot to swallow and it's hard. It's a lot to, con- to, process but when you follow that shit man you got to really think about like when you sign to these labels you are financing somebody probably getting killed by the police or damn. going to jail mm. damn mm. you gotta let that breathe i never even thought about it like that because i didn't even know know about it like like you said it goes that deep my brother like v- Vivendi, it's a company in, in France. They own so much. I was of looking our music. into the motherfuckers. I'm telling, go look at everything that they own, man. A lot, go- I, it's like in all the subsidiaries. I, because it was one day I think I was watching one of your videos, and I was just like, let me go actually look into what they do. In the back link, you go to Vivendi Group. They own by a whole another group who own by, and I'm like, man, who the fuck actually owns this shit? And they all sign. We all signed to them, and these dudes are eating. Off of our or off of our pain, because mm. like you know, Hove and Kendrick and Cole and Drake, they putting their soul in these records, man. Like they putting their real life pain, real life situation in these records, and y'all finance something. Y'all don't even listen to rap. Y'all don't even give a fuck. And y'all taking this money and building prisons. Y'all taking this when we were younger, man. Double XL Source King Magazine. Every other page was an ad for a liquor company. Most of the Thanks. liquor companies was owned by Seagrams. So y'all putting it in the music. Gin and Juice, who the Snoops call out? Who's he shout out? Seagram's Gin. Mm-hmm. This shit ain't no fucking coincidence. And I know some of y'all gonna be listening right now like, this is some conspiracy theorist, nigga. Just follow the money. Just go look at it. Go follow the money. Ain't no conspiracy who, theorist. Who owns that. Seagram? Is it LVMH? I don't know. I don't know who owns it now. Seagram's was like their own shit. Like, they didn't even have no whatever. But they bought MCA, and then MCA turned into Universal Records. And I forgot who Seagram's got bought by, but I don't think it's LVMH, or it might be now. But at that mm-hmm. time when they bought Interscope, they were their own thing, because Joseph Seagram, I think he was born in like the 1700s, if I'm not mistaken. Jeez. So he, he was old. Old, old ass fucker. So when it came time to buy the, buy the, buy the niggers, it's what he did, bought the nigger rap. What? 50 million? Come on, give me that. That's nothing. And and I'm glad you mentioned some of those terms too, because I do want to go a little bit deeper mm-hmm. into like the music industry. You talked about the masters, the publishing, publishing um, the 360 deals and things of that nature. A lot of times we don't understand the the actual business side. Our our artists, they just want to create. They don't want to worry about that. Um, and I think one of the most relevant videos I can think about is whenever Joe Button was talking to yeah, Lil, Lil Yachty. Yachty. And Lil Yachty was like, man, I'm just trying to have fun, bro. Like, I ain't worried about all of that shit. Two years later, yo so ass- QC. And you know, Q- Coach K, he's from Nap, man. And Indianapolis, we don't have many. So I go, I go t- 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 talk about him bad too much. But I'll post that video on my feed. First of all, it's hilarious. <laughs> but it's a, it's a generation gap too, man. Like 
a lot of people like Joe Button, he comes from that generation of, of tough love, right? Mm -hmm. So somebody yelling at you, you don't hear them yelling, you hear the message. And now the generation now, they aren't used to that, right? So the delivery wasn't really there, but everything he was saying was spot on because little Yachty didn't read his contract. Um, I think Rich Homie Quan, when I'm not trying to shit on him on this interview, but I think he said the same thing. He didn't read his contract. I think I saw some other day, Megan, she didn't read her contract. Mm -hmm. if, if you've ever sat down and read a music contract, who the fuck can read that shit? Like, if you're not a music attorney and you didn't go to law school for this, those terms are crazy. And so and I don't blame the artists, man, because if I'm from an area where the average median income is under 25,000, and I'm sharing draws with my brother and I got holes in my shoes that are three size too small. And all I got is these thoughts in my head. I'm able to put them onto a beat. If somebody wants to offer me a hundred thousand dollars, bro, I don't even know what the fuck masters are. What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. I know what a hundred thousand dollars is though. So I'm not mad at them for the people at that era, but now we definitely need to know because Going back to what I was saying, the reason you're seeing all these catalogs being bought or the reason Seagram's bought Interscope Records is for those masters. Masters, anytime music's getting paid, played, somebody's getting paid. Mm -hmm. And so whoever owns the masters or the publishing, they're going to get paid off of that forever. Mm -hmm. So, like, I don't even know if the Star Spangled Banner has masters or if it does. or No, that's probably not a, a good example. Like, any Elvis song, right? Elvis is going to get played forever. Whoever owns his masters, if it's his estate, you're going to get paid off of that. It's a revenue generating asset that never stops. That's mm. why they want it so bad. And black people, we just been giving away like M&Ms. So can you can you break down the difference between masters and publishing? Yeah. So masters and it's, and it's kind of weird. So it goes back once again. So when you were recording on analog, which was like the tape decks back in the 60s and 70s before all this all this digital stuff right you had to actually use tape tape was super expensive and so when you got done you had the final copy which was the master copy mm -hmm. and then you would duplicate du duplicate other versions are the ones that you want to sell to the public off of that master do y'all know what them duplicates were called mm -hmm. slaves what wow. go look it up Master slaves. slaves. That's crazy. That's wild. So your master recording, and then you had the slaves, which is the ones that would go to the stores and all that. Whoever was the producer or the owner of that, you own that master recording. That is in my vault. That is mine. Okay. So if I help write the song, like, all right, well, hell, you own the master recording, but like I wrote. Okay. Well, let's invent this thing called publishing. Right. You helped. Right. So now there's when you whenever there's a song, one half of it is a mass recording. The other half of it is a copyright with the, with the publishing and most independent artists. We own both. But if you're signed to a label, they usually will own the masters while you'll maintain your publishing unless you give that away. So it sounds weird, but it's like two different entities for the same thing. But when you get an advance, if you ain't read your contract, you'll give away your master, you give away your publishing, give away your royalty. Some people give away their name, their logo, their everything. Damn, that shit wild as a motherfucker. I, I'm glad you broke that down too, because I never really fully understood the difference between masters and publishing. Like I always, it always was a gray area for me. It sounds like publishing is just a, a, a hush puppy for artists, honestly. Like, hey, I own the big thing, but We'll give you a little, a little something. And yeah. I, I also heard you say, you know, you can own your masters, your, your publishing, and then there's royalties. So can you explain how you get paid off of those three? Yeah, so this is for every artist. This is going to be the gem of the interview. There's four things that you need in order to make sure you get 99% of your money. The other 1%, I mean, if somebody plays your song in Tanzania or some random streaming service, some dude invented his hut, like, and I'm not trying to be racist, but I'll, I ain't never been there. You know, you're not going to get that money. So you need a distributor. So a distributor is uh, CD Baby, Distro Kid, TuneCore, United Masters. You got to have your music through them. They're going to put your music on all platforms. So you got to sign up through a distributor. And they're going to collect royalties off, off of that for you. The second thing you need to have is a performing rights organization. So BMI, ASCAP, or CSAC. And those are the ones that collect your publishing money here in the U.S. 
and and Canada if it's CSAC. The third thing you need to have is Song Trust. They collect publishing and performance royalties all over the world. So anytime somebody might play you in Pandora and some other place, or like I said, Deezer or one of these other platforms we don't really listen to, they'll make sure that you'll get your money. And then the last one that, that you need is sound exchange. So if you ever get played on the radio somewhere or something like that, they'll collect all that money. So all if you got those four, a distributor, a performing rights organization, song trust, and sound exchange, you'll be able to collect 99% of your money. Will you be able to keep, keep up with it? No, this is why you pay them. You can try to track down everywhere in the world is playing your music, how much they owe you. Bro, that's a full-time job. That's yeah. why they got these companies that got that. And you pay them their fee, and they're going to get you 99% of, of your money. And unless you just want to sell the music directly off your website on some digital copy shit, and that's it, you're not going to get all your money from your music. It's just, just how it is. It's just too mm -hmm. convoluted. So mm -hmm. get those four things, and you should be good. Thank you. Gems, like you said, my hey, brother. Appreciate I, you yeah. for uh, educating us hey, on that. I even want to dive deeper with it. So, like, with with all these services that's doing this, because I know it's the streaming era. Now, you said like, you've, unless you're selling digital copies on your website, you're not really getting all your money. Like, with streaming, can you break down how streaming works and like how monetization actually goes on with that? Because I'm pretty sure that's some convoluted shit right there. So, uh, Spotify, I'm I'm gonna use them because we all know them. Started by Daniel Eck. I think it was like 2008 and he was Swedish and he had an idea like you know people are still in music and I know I stole my fair share of music over there. <laughs> yeah man line wire, <laughs> wire all that shit hey, hey, their share all of them and so he was like yo we gotta because Steve Jobs did a great thing with iTunes where he sold the tracks individually but people I don't I still don't want to buy it I want to mm -hmm. steal it so we came up with this idea where people could stream music in some sort of hub like a cloud. Now, this is a great idea, right? You got my music, you got y'all music, but I want Jay-Z's music. I want Taylor Swift's music. I want Michael Jackson's music. So I gotta go to the labels. It's three big record labels, Warner, Sony, and Universal. And yes, that's Warner Brothers, even though they sold their music arm, Sony PlayStation, Universal Studios. That's who owns all the music, basically. And he told them their idea. They're like, cool, we like it. What are you gonna give us? I mean, what do you want? Well, you want our music, what are you gonna give us? So he gave up equity stake. So all three of the major labels had equity stake in Warner, I mean, Warner, Sony, and Universal inside of Spotify. Hmm. So when he did that, right, what they did is like, okay, now since we have equity stake, we have an incentive to give you our artist's music. But whenever some, a song gets played, someone gets paid. Streaming didn't have any legislation at the time. Uh, do we really want to be paying our artists for a service that we own? No. The label's always trying to find a way to fuck the artists. So that's why that streaming rate is 0, 0.00 whatever cents because they made it so low for what a stream is actually valued. And so that's what artists get paid. So every a million streams for artists is around $4,000. Now, I think since then, I think Sony sold their share and some artists got paid off of that when they did. They sold their share of Spotify. I think Universal and Warner, and Warner still have a uh, stake in it. But it's pretty much like the finances of streaming. Um, and Spotify gets that money to pay from subscriptions, from ads, and all that stuff. But that's why if you go look at Spotify's financials, they've been, they've been struggling. They've been mm -hmm. in, the, in the red for a while. But that's why they make such a push on podcasting. They ain't got to pay no royalties for no podcasts. Like mm -hmm. we don't get royalty checks for our podcast. So that's why we'll sign Joe Rogan. We'll sign Michelle Obama because they, I don't want to say they want to get out of the music game, but it's kind of like with grocery stores. I don't know if y'all know this eggs lose grocery stores money, but you got to have eggs to bring people into the store. Yeah. Eggs lose grocery, grocery stores money. They break, they cheat. Yeah. But you got to have them because people come in and they'll buy other stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's what Spotify is kind of doing. Uh, we have Taylor Swift's music. We got Drake's music, but y'all also going to be here. Y'all going to listen to podcasts too. And if y'all listen to y'all podcasts for an hour, they'll make more money off of that than they ever will. If you listen to Drake's song for Man. 60 seconds. Man, that, that was a concept that Joe Budden introduced to me that I never really thought about like with podcasting. And I didn't realize that 
that was a, a big difference between the podcast industry and the music industry. They just paying upfront fees and then they just own it outright. Yep. Man. Instead of having to pay them royalties, man. Because it's, there's very little legislation when it comes to this podcast game so far. Like you said, there's not much going on. It's a new space, generally speaking. Yeah. yeah. So, same with social media. That's why I keep telling people what, what y'all doing, what I'm doing, this is great. Because eventually, like our kids, they won't have the freedom to make content like this. Because the legislation hasn't caught up yet. Mm -hmm. But eventually it will. And eventually social media is going to have the legislation like TV, like movie, like we, we can't go on ABC right now and have this and be cussing and nah, the FCC nah. would, would rip us a new one. You know what I'm Hell saying? Yeah. But now we can do it. Eventually, that's how social media is going to be. So whoever puts out the most content is going to build the biggest brand. And just like I've said it again, whenever a song gets played, somebody gets paid. It's going to get to the point, whenever this podcast episode gets played, Y'all gonna get paid. You damn no matter right. what. So that's I ain't why selling shit. <laughs> exactly. You gotta, you gotta keep your bastards. You gotta keep your bastards. And this is something for all my influencers. I want y'all to think about this too. Eventually, it's gonna get to the point where we we need to charge for interviews and not an upfront fee. I need 50% of all the advertising money going forward. Not not with y'all, but I'm just saying down the line, because if I'm Beyonce, no matter who I interview with, they ain't coming to see you. Yeah. They come to see me. So why doesn't Beyonce get, if I was her, I need 80% of all future advertising money forever in perpetuity until the world blows up, until the aliens come here and Will Smith got to defend us, nigga. I need that money. And that's how you got to start thinking. Like, because we ain't doing this for the next 10 years. Our great, 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 great grandchildren are going to be listening to this right now. Like my seven generations from now, they listen to Paul Paul Dorian right now. And I hope that y'all listen to everything I said and y'all ain't fuck my money up. But that's that's what we got to start thinking. Like, black people, we just got to go further because going back to, to Joseph Seagram's, he thought about that shit, which is why mm -hmm. his descendants bought basically bought Death Row. And now Death Row is owned by Hasbro. Mr. Potato Head owns what? Death Row. Yeah. Right? yeah. Man. Crazy but shit, like man. Like you said, that foresight, thinking about it on a deeper level, when it comes to ownership. And that's why I love what you do with your brand, bro. And I have one more term I want you to break down for the music industry for no us, doubt. my brother. The 360 contract. <laughs> we always hear about it, but I don't know what the fuck it means. I just know if you have one of those, you are getting with no grease. Man, so what happened back in the day was like, you know, like Whitney Houston, like they, they rest in peace. Like they own her masters. Um, Whitney wrote summer songs, but not a lot. So they owned the, owned the publishing. But when Whitney went on tour, when Whitney did movies, they didn't care. Whitney Houston was going diamond. She was, she's the greatest voice of all time. They didn't care. And then Napster happened. Mm. And Napster allowed us to steal the music. Mm. So if we're stealing the music, you ain't getting no royalties. Your publishing don't mean shit because I'm getting the music and you not, you don't know who's keeping track of it. So the record labels, they were about to go down. Like, that's why they sued Napster. They were suing college kids because it was about to be over. And so what they said was like, how in the fuck are we going to make some money? <laughs> well, you motherfuckers going on tour. We paying for the tour. All right, we need your tour money. What else you doing on tour? Are you selling merch? Oh, we need some of that merch money. Oh, you got to deal with Sprite? We need that. Oh, well, technically the reason, Whitney, that you were in the bodyguard, I'm just using her, I don't know if she was in a 360 deal or not. But the reason you were in the bodyguard is because we made you so goddamn famous. Mm. So technically, you owe us a piece of that too. You know what? This is what we're going to do. Anybody who signs with us, we need a piece of any money you make ever because we made your ass famous. And once again, I'm a nigga in the hood. I'm sharing draws with my brother. You're going to give me $100,000. You're going to take a future revenue from when I'm in movies? Nigga, I'm in movies. Who cares? But eventually, we got more sophisticated and we realized, goddamn, 360 deal, I'm legit a slave. Like mm -hmm. anything I do, they they get a piece of it. Hey, I thank you for that. Cause people need to understand that, especially like when it comes to music and ownership, just like, yeah, the label, they can make you hot, but you don't want them to have a hand on everything. Nah. Cause eventually, like at one point, like they could say they made you hot, but you still the motherfucker that made the music. You Swear still the one that built that connection with your fan base. And now they getting to reap the benefits. So I think I heard you say that somebody 
great granddaughter out here snorting coke off somebody <laughs> yeah. dick in college because of Where? that shit. Like, yeah. yeah. Man, when I was at IU, man, I used to wonder how these girls was 20 years old driving G-Wagons and shit, and they got the most expensive apartment on campus. They great-granddaddy owned somebody masses. He probably got it on some random deal on some random shit. Like, we got to stop giving all that away. Like, it's kind of like if um, if the NBA came to LeBron was like, yeah, we made you, we gave you all your money, essentially, which got you the Nike money, which got you the Gatorade money, and we see you invested in this Blaze piece, and you took 10%, or oh, we need a piece of that. LeBron be like, what the fuck are you talking about? Get out of here. He's not giving you that. But if he was a rapper, he had a 360 deal, what are you going to say? He ain't got mm. no choice. Mm. Man. For thought. Hell yeah. Now, now I want to move forward and move on into your rap career, mm -hmm. my brother. Um, the way that you were able to gain some success, the way you were able to rank number one in France, the way you was able to get a million number streams. Number three overall. Yeah. Man, that's, yeah. not, that's not nothing to play with. Number man. three on the charts on iTunes, straight independent is nothing to play Hell with. Hell no, nah, man. So I, I kind of want to talk about the ways that you were able to learn and navigate. And I heard you mention it earlier what you were doing on uh, Periscope on your Sundays where you adding people to playlists. Mm -hmm. I think you were really, really innovative with that. I don't even think you knew what was about, no, what I you didn't. were doing, like no. what was about to pop off. So I kind of want to go into some of that, my brother. Man, that's, it is crazy. And that's why, you know, going back to Shadi's quote, he needs to send me some royalties for this. I'm shouting this nigga out nonstop. But going back to his quote, when you put in that two years of work, like a part-time job, you start seeing the gaps. I talk to the pond all the time about, look at the gaps. See, there's a gap in every single industry. And so I kept seeing all these gaps inside the music business. I'm like, okay, what one can I feel? And one night we was on Periscope and... We were just having a conversation. Somebody said, hey, Dorian, did you hear about Nelly? I'm like, nah, what happened? They said he owes the IRS like $40 million or something. I was like, damn. Jeez. So I went and looked it up because I always had to fact check because they might just get in there and start lying. So I started fact checking. I saw I came across an article on Business Insider and it talked about how much Nelly owed. They only know it was 40, but it, he owed some money. And inside of the article, they embedded tweets. And in the tweets was from his fans. And his fans said, Hey man, this is how many streams we gonna have to give of Nelly for him to pay off his tax debt. Somebody had did the math. Let's stream his music all night. At this time, y'all, I probably had a thousand plays total. I'm talking on SoundCloud, YouTube, Spotify, people at my church who ain't I ain't talked to in ten years. I probably had a thousand plays total across the board. And I was like, damn, does that streaming shit work? This is 2016. And I was like, you know what? Let's do this. I'm talking to the pond on Periscope. Let's have my song "Don't Sleep." Don't sleep. Stream it all night while you sleep. You can't do this anymore. Spotify shut you down. Stream it all night while, while we sleep and let's, and let's see what happens. They did. Two days later, I checked my account Spotify at 2,300 streams. I was like, what the fuck? Like, because I've been making music for two years. And I had twice as many plays total than one. I was like, oh, this streaming shit works. And I knew that I was going to get paid from it. So I was like, how can I get more streams? Like, I was like a crackhead, like Pookie. And so... <laughs> I went to Google and I started just looking up how to get more streams. This was really early and I forgot whose blog I came across and they were breaking it down and they talked about playlists. I was mm -hmm. like, okay. So then I started hitting up Spotify playlists on my own and I really figured it out. And at the time, playlists was like the wild, wild west back then. These people were working at Cracker Barrel and they have a playlist with 10,000 followers and everybody's listening to the music on there. So if you hit them up on Facebook, like, hey man, I got 22,000 followers on Periscope. You add my song to a playlist, I'm going to shout you out, hopefully to get you some more followers, all that. He was like, okay, cool. So they would add my song to a top three spot, and I would get streams. I just kept getting more and more streams. The checks kept getting bigger. And that's how I've passed my first 1 million streams on Spotify. And I, and I can't even lie, man. Like, being an artist who I started from scratch, I didn't pay my rent in my studio apartment in Chicago and took my tax check to buy my first computer, to learn how to make music. I watch hours and hours of YouTube videos, you know, getting doubted. My first album got shitted on. For me to get a million streams, man, somebody, my music got played a million times. I cried, I can't even lie, I cried, man. I was like, damn, and I got paid off of that. And so I learned that playlisting was fucking powerful. And that mm -hmm. feeling I felt, I said, every artist deserves to feel this. Mm -hmm. You deserve to know that people are listening to your music and you got paid from it. 
So I always kept that inside of my mind. And at the time, I was still doing the SoundCloud stuff. I kind of went away because SoundCloud, they, they weren't paying. So I yeah. went over here to Spotify. So kept doing it, kept shopping my songs to playlists for years. Like I'm putting in work. And then one dude I'd hit up, he had added already like six of my songs. I had a new single. I hit him. He was like, Dorian, I, uh, I sold the playlist. It's like, the fuck you mean you sold the playlist? He said, I sold it. I'm like, why aren't you selling it to me? And, and he, I was like, how do, you, how do you sell it? And I forget dude's name. Man, he gave me the sauce. Like, he broke it all down. Like, you, you go, to, go to Twitter, and there was like a Twitter help, Twitter care page, and you had to have your address and the credit card and all that, and people could transfer playlists from one person to another. I said, how much did you sell it for? He said, man, I sold it for $100. I said, yes. What? What are you talking about? $100? What do you mean? <laughs> so, so you know what I did? At the time, I had this database. I had been shopping my playlist, shopping my songs. So I went, I hit everybody up, like, yo, I want to buy your playlist. Six of them hit me back. So I bought their playlist. And I was buying them for me. It's like, damn, now I can add all my music, and I can just get all the plays. But I realized at that time, I own my own distribution network. Mm. So I'm like, other artists gonna want this too. So let me start charging for playlist places. Not on people mm. look at, listen like, Spotify frowns upon that. Fucking Universal, Warner, and Sony got equity stake in Spotify. I don't wanna hear that shit, okay? I'm an independent artist, nigga. We gotta get it how we, how we get it. And so once that happened, I started adding artists to the, to the, to the playlist. I started charging for that. And then that started giving me some working capital. And then that's how my brand kind of took mm. off and how I got into the playlist again. Mm. It, so was, was that kind of like the birth of group 82? That's exactly was the birth of group 82. Be, because I always had group 82 because eight to August 2nd, that's my birthday. But that was just my label, like everybody who has a label. But I didn't know, once I got my million streams on Spotify, that was great, but that was some hard work. Mm -hmm. That was only $4,000 too. At, at the time, my job was paying me $5,000 a month. I was like, if, I ha if I'm going to leave, I got to find a way to match this income. What else can I do? So once I got the playlist, I was like, okay, that's a great feature, kind of like the eggs at the, at the grocery mm -hmm. store. That's going to bring people in because they're going to be attracted to that. The, the plaques, they like all that. But I can't have my entire family's livelihood dependent on Spotify playlists because if they take the playlist, then I'm done. So what else can I offer? When I was coming up and still now, it was so hard to get an artist website done, so hard to get a biography written, so hard to get cover art, so hard to get a beat store, a merch store. There was nobody that was offering this. So I filled the gap. Mm -hmm. I started seeing other people who were doing it, but they weren't me. They weren't black. They weren't unapologetically them. They weren't rapping. It was like these rock dudes who used to be Led Zeppelin's manager. And she, man, nobody would hear what the fuck that you got to say, dog. Like, so I knew there was a gap. The, mm -hmm. the music, the independent music business game needed a real nigga who wasn't subscribed to none, none, none of these labels. None of that industry and, bullshit. Exactly. And I used to coach college basketball, so I already knew how to talk to them. I already knew how to talk to that demographic. All those years of engaging on Periscope, I knew what they responded to. So I just took my personality and I brought it to social media and I became like the spokesperson for Group 82. And then, man, that shit, that shit changed my life, man. Hey, man, I love it. And I remember because I was watching one of your videos and I watched all the way to the end and you're talking about Group 82. I was like, let me go check this, this site out, man. I was like, oh, this nigga got products, nigga. I was like, oh, <laughs> this nigga's making yeah. money. It's not like, just music. I told that to David. I was like, hey, man, take this shit out. I was like, oh, you can get your website done. Yeah. If I was like, he's charging niggas to get on these playlists. I was like, oh, he making this bread. Mm -hmm. Got to, man. That, that's... uh. You know, we got some stuff rolling out for, for this year. And anybody that's been paying attention to my content, you know I'm becoming more universal for entrepreneurs, not just the, the music business. But once, like, this playlisting era ends, I'll really give y'all the insight to the financials and everything because it's going to be a, a great study and, and probably a great case study down the line for the minimal investment that I put in and what I got back and what it did for me. Man, it, it literally, I'm not joking. It, it allowed me to leave my job. It's made me more money than I've ever made in my life. It's got me more residual income. It's built my brand. I mean, it's got me verified on Instagram. It's the reason that my YouTube's up. That 
investing in those playlists literally changed my perspective on everything and it, it changed my life. One thing I love about your story, my brother, is like with Group 82 and the way you built it out, I love that it's like you said, you fill in the gaps. You didn't try to go out and, and do a bunch of different shit that was unrelated to music. You built out everything within the realm you were already in. So like now at this point with Group 82, how many different streams, just in terms of like products, services, things that you offer, have you built outside of just making music? Yeah, so we got Group, group 82 Music, so that's the whole music arm. We have Group 82 Media. Um, so in the midst of me trying to figure out this social media shit, I had to learn ads, right? Facebook and Instagram ads, I gotta advertise the, the business. I can't depend on content going viral for us to get sales. Not a marketing and, plan. No, not at all. And I used to do like everybody else do, hit boost post, right? Hit promo, right? And it would get some, I'm like, I know this ain't what I'm supposed to be doing. <laughs> and so I remember one time, this was, uh, this was like 2016, 2017, I was still working for somebody. And I went into Facebook ad manager to like, okay, so I don't know if y'all know Kita, the uh, dance kid, like he did a song, he had a video with, with the song Cut It, him and his sisters. Yeah, I know like, what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He can really, really dance. Dance yeah. with Usher. So um, I had found him online and I, and I was talking to his mom and they did a video for my song, Don't Sleep. And that really gave it a push. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to take this Kita dance video and I'm going to put it, I'm going to run a Facebook ad on it. I'm going to just go to Facebook ad manager. It's going to take like 10 minutes. Man, I walked into Facebook ad manager, dog. Yo, that shit I, got a, music. I got a master's. I'm like, what the fuck is this shit? Yep. Yeah, man. And I was like, yo, I, I'm, I don't have the time to process this right now. I'm gonna come back to it later. So once I started doing the boost post and promo years later, I went back in. I was like, man, shit. I don't know what's know. going on. Know, I don't know. <laughs> you know, so big so a conversion. <laughs> none of this shit. And so I ended up taking a uh, Facebook ads class. I'm not going to shout them out because I got other stuff coming. But I took a Facebook ads class and it broke down everything that was inside of there. And so once I learned about Facebook Pixel, for those you don't know that, you got to have Facebook Pixel installed on your website because Facebook Pixel basically takes attendance on your website. It keeps track of who's there, how long they stayed, what they clicked on. So if you ever want to run ads to them again, you can say, hey, this person clicked on this color T-shirt Let's run an ad for them with this color T-shirt as opposed to run an ad for them with this nail polish, right? Mm -hmm. You don't want to run ads that don't apply to them. And Face of Pixel allows you to do that. So I learned that. I learned the ins and outs of that. And once, just like y'all were just saying, I knew I was feeling the same way. It was the same about the music industry. Like I knew people were, were confused, so mm -hmm. I needed Group 82 Music. So I said, let me start like a social media ads agency, Group 82 Media. So that's what we did. So Group 82 Media, we, we would build out your website. We run ads for you. We help you hire interns, all that stuff. We scaled back from that. Cause like I said, we got some more stuff coming. But that was a revenue stream. Um, I took my free ebook. I made it for sale on Amazon. That was the revenue stream. I got a lot of affiliate links on my videos. Y'all click any of those. That's a revenue stream. One of them is monthly. I get that re residually. I get paid on Instagram badges. I'm about to start getting paid for Instagram ads on some of my videos. I get paid on YouTube ads. The past three months, we made $8,000 off of YouTube ads each month. So you got all these streams of income coming in outside of music. Your music's just a foundation for it, but you got to find other ways to bring in money. Mm. Hey. I got to give it to him. Hey, because it's beautiful. Uh, we talk with it with our one of our, our favorite people, man, brother Dre, Andre C. Hatchet. He talks about that all the time. Like people want to build seven streams of income. We see that shit. It looks sexy. It sounds good, but you it doesn't mean going out outside of your seven yeah, different yeah, damn businesses, seven different self-employed streams of income. Like like you just broke down to everybody. Everything you did was within the domain of what you was already doing. Yeah, and I think that's just so major, bro. And I do, I do want to ask you a little bit more with like Group 82 Media. Like, what was the process looking like with you building out that team? True, oh, man, shit. So the thing about Group 82, which is why we're starting to like, you know, go in kind of different directions. Everything was dependent on me, man. You know, like I had like the Group 82 music, like I was the expert on all that shit. Group 82 Media, I was the expert on Facebook ads and all that. So when I would hire a team, 
it was to teach them stuff I already knew. So like for Group 82 Music, I didn't have time to hunt them playlists after a while. And I knew other people wanted to know the Spotify game. So I hired, I hired Spotify and business development interns to hunt the playlists for me so they can under, understand that. Um, when, it, when it came to graphic design, I wasn't about to learn that stuff. Graphic designers are a dime a dozen. There's so many people that are in college. So we offered a graphic design internship and we, we hit the ball out of the park on the first one we hired. Her name's Cassie. We got her. She was a sophomore at Penn State. She's about to graduate in May at Penn State. She's been with us the whole time. Like, I love Cassie. We drafted Shout out, her. Cassie. Shout out, Cassie. She's LeBron of our company. She Anything you see graphic design, she she did that shit. So we we got her, made her an intern, and we started paying her. We've been paying her for like two years now. And then um, video editing. I didn't know that. And I wasn't about to learn that. Once again, hire interns. A lot of people don't know this. If you have an LLC, you can hire interns. You can hire unpaid interns because a lot of them need college credit, especially right now. So you can get them have an unpaid remote internship, or even if you want to pay them, it's, it's up to you. People are looking for that. And so I just use that to my advantage because in exchange for them working for us, I'm teaching you the Spotify game. I'm helping Cassie build her portfolio for graphic design. Now she, can, she got everything with us, like video editors. These schools don't teach them social media video. And I, I, if y'all want to talk about college, that's a whole nother episode. Don't get started <laughs> on that shit. But they're not teaching them social media video, right? So I'm teaching them, you, this is what you got to do on Instagram. This is why I picked this color blue. This is why I picked this font. This is why this meme works. This matches my personality. What you did is going to weaken and not emphasize this point of the video. Cut the music off so they can hear this because this is serious. Turn the music up because that way they can vibe with it. Like, there's so many things that go into these videos that they're not teaching. So when you hire interns, if you give them something in exchange, they'll love the work for you. That's powerful. And uh, I think you definitely just drove home a fact for us that we've been talking about for a long (laughs) motherfucking time. For a long time. We've been talking about damn interns. But, uh, man. No, the other thing I definitely want to get on with you too, my brother, is um the True Support campaign. Mm. Man, yeah. The album True Support, man. I, I think I mentioned it already on this podcast. You what, you, what you did was so innovative. So can we kind of go into like how you came up with that and yeah. just how yeah. it played out? Yep. So um so True Support was my third album. And um any artist. We're living in a very microwave musical culture. What I mean by that is people consume music very, very fast. So they're going to consume your album in an hour, and then that's probably going to be it. So you have to tell a story in the marketing of your album. If you can't tell a story, then don't drop an album. And I knew for me, Hmm. I wanted to include my audience because they had been elevating me for two years. I've been giving them all this content. So how can I get them involved? Shout out to Curtis King. Curtis King with, with two S's. He, he's a producer. He's doing like this music business stuff. And he had Curtis King University, which he still has. And it's like $20 a month, but his stuff was geared towards producers. And I, and I got in, I was in there for about three months and I wasn't paying attention to it. But then one day I was like, I'm paying money. Let me get in here. Let me really pay attention. And he had a section in there. He said, how I charted top 10 on iTunes. I was like, what the hell? So I went and clicked. And what he did was with his album sale, anybody that bought his album, he gave them a beat for free Mm because his his audience was primarily artists and music producers. So if you bought two albums, you got three beats, all this stuff. So he made his album like $4.99 and he sent out a whole bunch of beats. I think he probably sold like 200 copies. He charted like number seven or something. I'm like, shit, I can do that. I'm like, they love these playlist placements. And we got a permanent playlist placement, which goes for $250. I said, I'm going to tell them, if y'all buy my album, I'm going to give y'all a playlist placement for free. And Mm -hmm. I was completely transparent because for people to buy your album now, they got to truly support you because I can stream your music, bro. Like, I don't want, I don't need your album. So that's why I called the album True Support. So we did that, had the whole campaign because I know my audience loves, loves the playlist placement. We sold almost a, a thousand copies pre-order. Then when it launched, when the album came out, because that's when iTunes actually takes the money out, they had to send in screenshots and share it on social media and all that. And then the charts came out. We was number number three, man. 
Let's go. Hey, man, that's dope as hell, man. God damn. I definitely love the, the value proposition you brought with it, too. Like, that was, it's so undeniable. You like, and it's not like it was capping your rap when you said it. This is the $249 value, and you can get it today for $9.99. All you got to do is buy my album. Yep. Hey. Yep. And I think, once again, pay attention to the industry, too. Justin Bieber's bundling T-shirts, Travis Scott's bundling ticket sales. We're not on that level, you know, but there is something you got to give people. They don't, this is going to hurt a lot of artists' feelings. No one cares about your music, man. They, they don't care. They can listen to Drake, Cole, Kendrick, Nas, Ho. They, they got endless amounts of music. What's going to make them care about you? Like you just said, the value proposition. And the value has to be so extreme that they're like, what I look like not buying this man's album. He's given me content for two years. He's helped me make money. I'm going to get a $250 value. It's only nine bucks. I told him, too. I said, if you've been following me all these years, you ain't buying my album, unfollow me right now. Hmm. Like, true support. Like, come on, God damn it. And they, they, they showed up. And then what happened, because like, like y'all mentioned in the intro, I've been number one in France for a while now. And like my, I was only on the U.S. charts for a day. I've been on the French charts for 47 days. So because of YouTube, because of that campaign, now the music got out. People actually listened to it. And France is fucking with it. It's been 47 days. I ain't ran no ads in France. That true support playlist ad campaign has been dead for months, but they still rocking with it. So for any artists, once again, marketing is going to get you attention. But if they rock with your content, that's when your stuff starts spreading. And I, I'm glad that you said that because I'm we're releasing a podcasting course. I'm uh, teaching a course on podcasting, what you need to do. And that's one of the biggest things that I said is that value, man. You got to give something that sticks. You got to give some content that's shareable. Don't just come on here clout chasing, trying to get a highly viral moment, trying to upset people. Like actually give some value and give a fuck about what you're putting out. Yep, exactly. And I'm glad that y'all said that, too, because that's the stuff that we're working on. I'm working on a music marketing course where I'm going to show everything behind the the True Support campaign. Mm -hmm. Every website, every link, how we did the pre-orders. Like, I'm going to show it all. It's going to be premium price. So if you ain't ready to pay, I don't want to hear you. But I'm going to go behind the scene. But but you're right. Same with podcasts. You know, like, hey, listen to my podcast. For what? There's millions of podcasts. What are you giving me? Like, why do I need to come here? Like, what is it? That's why y'all have guests on. So everything in life, man, especially on social media, you got to be selfless. What mm. are you giving other people? What value are you giving them? That's going to make them give you their attention in return. Message. Y'all stick with that one, man. My brother, all My brother been on here with the flamethrower <laughs> like... <laughs> I'm telling you, man, just been burning it up, bro. Hey, sheesh. Real talk, though. Dorian, I do have one more question for you before we, uh, I'm not sure Jalen got anything else too, but uh, so for somebody who's a new independent artist, they just getting started, what would you recommend to them in today's climate? Like how would they get started? Man, I, I've thought about this a lot. Um, you know, you got to know your gifts. You got you to gotta know your strengths and your weaknesses. Now, when it comes to you making music, like, so I'm just use rappers. When it comes to you rapping, when you, when you first start, you don't know what you're good at. You're trying to sound like your inspirations. I was trying to sound like Nas and Kanye and Luda and Ice Cube. And I'm not, I'm not them. I had to find my own voice. And I'm, mm. I'm still finding it to this day. So don't worry about that. But you have to understand, okay, do I know how to make beats? Do I have an ear for music? Do I just need to understand the software to make beats? Do I know how to mix? If I don't, okay... You got to lock that down. Get your beats off of YouTube. Buy the stems. Don't half-ass. Just buy the MP3 and the Wave. And then find you an engineer that you trust and that's going to help you get your sound. It's like McDonald's. They had to get burgers down first before they went to everything else. You know. Mm -hmm. So make sure that you have the music locked down. After that, you have to be, as an artist, 100% real with yourself all the time. It's the reason I go so hard on social media. It's the reason I come at people so hard on social media, because I come at myself the exact same way. I knew that I was good at, good at sales. In-person sales always have been. So when it came to sales and marketing and business and all that, like, I'm passionate about that. 
I read about that. That's my strengths. I'm going to handle that. When it comes to graphic design and video editing, yeah, I could probably teach myself that, but I'm not passionate about that shit. Mm. You know, so how long can I avoid graphic design? How long can I avoid video editing? Or can I find somebody? As an artist, lock down the music, whatever your strengths are, quadruple down on them joints. Like, become the best at your strengths and in your weaknesses, eventually you have to out, outsource those out. And I can't tell anybody what those are, but you have to absolutely do that. Now, the next part is social media strategy. You have to have one. This is the best social media strategy is for any entrepreneur out there. But Bama use artists as, as the example. No one cares about your music. Y'all heard me say this tonight already. They don't care, but they care about other stuff. For me, I was a college basketball coach. So when you start talking about basketball at a deeper level, people know that I know what I'm talking about. So what I would do is I would go on Instagram, I go to one of these basketball pages, I turn on the notifications, and as soon as they post, mm. I would go watch the clip and I write a long comment about basketball. Mm. United Masters, I did this for the longest with them. As soon as they post, I watch the clip, I write a long comment about the music business. Because my comment's long, people gonna read it. Because it's early, it's gonna get likes. It's gonna get pushed up in the comment thread. These mm. accounts have a bunch of followers. People are gonna read the comments. They're, they're gonna comment on that comment. And then what do you do when you see a comment that catches your interest? You always you click that follow. person's page. So you click the profile, and now my bio and the link in my bio is optimized for me to sell whatever that I'm trying to sell. So as an artist, whatever it is that you into, basketball, pottery, weed, shoelaces, candles, essential oils, find wherever these people are on the internet and go nerd out with them. Why? Because everybody listens to music. Everybody listens to music. They ain't listen to your music because you don't have a personal connection with them. But if they know that you nerd out about organic diapers the same way that they do, they're going to listen to your music over Drake because they don't give a fuck about Drake's organic diaper knowledge. They know that you have that. And that's how you can build your audience. You start with the minor, minor audience. And then you do something like True Support where they share your shit. And then that's how you build up. Mm. Mm. The blueprint. The blueprint. Fire, man. Fire. I did have one last question. I, I ain't gonna lie. You, I, no, it's not that question. Ah. It's another one. It's actually pertaining to the music. It was a, uh, another uh, video that I saw that you done uh, whenever you're breaking down Panda and just the whole the way music is structured, oh, yeah, uh, hitting, on, hitting on certain consonants, certain syllables and things like that. I'm a big music nerd too. I played in a band my whole life. Dope. I ain't gonna lie. Like, I, I love music. And whenever you were going through that, I was like, damn, bro, he really like... You had me realize like, designer was a lot smarter than I thought he was. I ain't gonna lie. So I, I just kind of want to go through, how can someone, if they were trying to get into music, how can they educate themselves on some of those things? YouTube and, and Google are, are the ultimate teachers. And like I said, when you nerd out on stuff, and y'all know this because y'all have had to nerd out to have the success that you have, your algorithm starts working for you. Your, mm -hmm. your algorithm starts putting stuff in front of you that they know that you want to see because you nerd out on these type of things. And so when you start studying like the science of songwriting, which I don't think any artists really do, especially rappers, you'll understand why Old Town Road did what it did. The first time I heard Old Town Road, I told my lady, I said, this song gonna be out of here. I didn't know it was gonna be the, hot, the longest running number one ever, but from the melody to the pre-hook to the beat, I mean, he, it's damn near yeah. the fucking perfect song as far as like universal appeal. And everybody like, that shit's trash. You don't get it. That motherfucker went, not, it was number one for 19 weeks. It went diamond. So you can think it's trash all you want. Y'all think everything gotta be super lyrical, all these double, triple entendres and all that make you feel good like you selling dope you never did. Mm -hmm. There's a science to songwriting. Jay-Z studied this shit more than anybody. When you listen to very early Hove, like Reasonable Doubt and even like the, the, the one after that, and then you listen to when he got to Annie, Hard Not Life, he studied songwriting. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, that, that song's hard. It is. And there's certain constants like your voice is an instrument. So the... <laughs> Sound that sounds like a snare drum. Mm. So when you listen to Drake sicko mode, he's hitting that shit. When you listen to Drake on both, like because Drake's like the best of shit, he's hitting that. And so you got to be wondering about that too when you're writing your song. Okay, like I said, snap here. Can I say crunch? Because that crunch 
sounds like the snare, will it still make sense as opposed to snap? You know what I mean? And when you start doing that, those sounds help with the, with the music. One thing that I think about all the time, every time I hear this song, is, is, is look alive. And at the end of Block Boy JB's verse, he says, um, I'm sitting so close, I could have took the stat sheet. Yeah. Like, man, he should have said, I'm sitting so close, I could have snatched the stat sheet. Snatch, stat, shh. You know what I mean? It's like, boom, boom, boom. Like, you would have hit him a lot more with that consonant. When you start studying songwriting, you start nerding on that shit, it starts making a whole lot of sense. So just study the game, man, and watch these interviews. Like, designer, everybody talks shit. Well, why do you have any more hits? Bro, Panda went number one. Like, listen to what this man said. It makes sense. Panda, panda, panda. <laughs> <laughs> like, I got bros in the letter. I ain't gonna lie, that shit was a hit. Yeah, man. Was, was was, man. Man. Hey, you just saying something with that Black Boy JB verse too. I just oh, that line always did bother me, bro. Like I like, man, he really could have he could have ended that verse stronger. And yeah, it's it's a lot of songs that you can catch that as a listener, you'd be like, man, he should have put this there instead of that there. But like you saying, just paying attention and actually studying the music, actually mastering your craft. I think a lot of times, once again, we just want to be creative. We got feelings, dealing with depression and stuff, but people don't want to actually take this serious and realize the power that they're holding whenever they're putting out some of these things. Absolutely, man. It's, it's, there's a science to everything. Follow the money and follow the blueprint. We, I don't know what y'all believe, but I believe the world's been here for millions of years. We only going to be here for about 100. Everything we did, what? I, I always tell him that. I'm like, bro, we are a blink in the fucking, like, on Universe, the time. I'm nigga. like, bro, you got to think about how many people that came. There's some great motherfuckers. But guess what? This motherfucker going to keep on spinning, and it's going to keep on going. Man, I got a quote that I, that I heard, man, that, and that shit, like, fucked me up. It said... So we're on, we're in, I'm in Texas. Y'all, where y'all are, I don't know if y'all want to give y'all location, but we're in the United States, right? And we got the whole earth. So that's a big ass shit. And mm. then there's, they changed the names of planets. I guess Pluto ain't a planet no more. So I don't know how many planets that there are anymore. And we sit inside of a, of a galaxy. Mm -hmm. And this galaxy exists inside of the universe. No, I was actually just listen, looking into this last night, actually, bro. I'm a nerd again. You know, I'm a nerd. So is we sit inside a solar system, and our yeah. solar system sit inside the galaxy. There we go. But Thank you. Thank you. They said there are more galaxies out there than there are grains of sand on the beach. Mm -hmm. What? Bro, like like I said, I don't I was just in my nerd bag last night. I looked at a picture from the Hubble telescope that was taken and there's like these these galaxies, this cluster of galaxies, this shit has been here for over like 100 billion years. And they're like this shit's gone. Now they're studying galaxies that are currently being created, bro. Mm -hmm. And they told they was like, "Oh yeah, this shit's like uh, seven, seven, 70 billion light years away from us. So that, that means it takes 70 billion years for a piece of light to reach from that part of the universe so to here, our part of the we universe. We see in the past. <laughs> we see in the past. Bro, when, and whenever I tell you I was just in my nerd bag and I was just like, man, what the fuck? Like, I'm really insignificant is what it told me though. Yes. And it's just like, yes. you know, like what... What am I really here for? Like, mm -hmm. obviously, there's a whole bunch of a lot of other shit that can be it's happening. Greater than just yourself. Exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and that's and that, and that was my point because it made me feel like that. Like, damn, I'm really not nothing in a billion years from now. Like, I hope they remember me, but who knows? Like, I might not be as popular as like Jesus. You know what I'm saying? Like, and ain't no telling. We can argue about him all day, but like, with that said, everything we've done has been done before. Mm. So why are y'all trying to reinvent the fucking wheel? Mm. And I know that y'all was going to ask me your last question, but I'm just going to an like, like Clubhouse. Like, why the fuck are y'all trying to reinvent the wheel? Like, I understand y'all want to be on the new platform. I, I get that. But with YouTube and Instagram paying and already popping, and if you don't have an audience already, why are you hopping around? You need to build your audience on one platform first and then go to the other ones. If you already have an audience... Fuck with Clubhouse. I get it. But for people that don't, nigga, you need to be on Instagram. You need to be mm -hmm. on YouTube and just do what you click on. People always like, what's your social media strategy? What's the secrets? I looked at the videos I was clicking on. I made the same videos. Like, nigga, everything's been done before. 
Like none of us are fucking any new way that our ancestors were. The, the goal is to have a baby. And we all know how to do it. Like, stop trying to reinvent shit, man. You know, like y'all making this too difficult. Cause like you said, we 70 billion light years away from some aliens. They don't tell them what they got over there. Like y'all, y'all making it harder these days. Exactly. Mm. Man, that, that's yeah. real shit. Hell yeah. So he he went through the the, the what's on your timeline. <laughs> that that hey, I ain't gonna lie, I had my crawls with Clubhouse too. Man, I remember I was I trying to get on that shit. Dog. That was just like, man. This is a whole lot of cap on this app, bro. Like people just doing some crazy shit. Mother, there was this one girl. She was like, "Yeah, I've been on Clubhouse for since eleven o'clock last night. It was six o'clock in the morning." <laughs> I'm like, "She's like, oh my god, I'm so inspired. I learned so much." There's a lot of but niggas like, not getting shit done. I'm on like, Clubhouse. bro, you just sat up on Clubhouse for since eleven o'clock to six o'clock. <laughs> you know how productive you could have been if you'd have took that time out and just took what you learned from that one person hour. That first hour you were there and went go actually implement these things. Well, fuck, you should have went your ass to bed. <laughs> fuck that. <laughs> you need sleep. And that's and that's the thing, man. Like, what's on my timeline? I literally just posted a Dory at Dorian Group 82 on Instagram. Clubhouse gets investment interest at one billion dollar valuation. So, like, they're valued at a billion dollars off of us doing dumb shit like that. Like, black people. The whole world moves on us. When we say mm. something's cool, it's it's cool. it's cool. Every single social media platform, they were cool, but they wasn't shit until we got into it. Mm-hmm. And, and, and we take it used to be we just gave them like like the like the hood card or whatever niggas want to want to say hood pass. But now the, barbe- the, the barbecue exactly. <laughs> we kept inviting them there. But now Silicon Valley has found a way to monetize and to actually quantify that. Clubhouse's strategy when they were coming up with this, and it's the usual suspects, Stanford MBA grads, they went to Anderson Horowitz, the most popular VC firm, got the idea, got it funded, and then what they do? Well, we got to go to the niggas. How we, how we going to do it? We going to bring them in, we going to pay whatever, get them to argue and start doing these conversations. Then the, the niggas, they always figure it out. They're so goddamn creative. They always figure it out. And what we do? We fucking figure it out why they get a billion dollars and we don't get shit. I don't know if a lot of people know this, but Fitbit, okay? Fitbit was founded by an Asian dude, and I forget his name. And his parents didn't go to college. They were, they were immigrants, I forget from what country. But they set up shop in the hood. They sold beauty supply products in black neighborhoods. He was on the interview with, with Guy Raz, How I Built It, one of my favorite podcasts. And he was talking about how his mom would literally go through Jet Magazine and Ebony Magazine and look for hairstyles and she would buy those type of wigs so she could sell it to her audience. Wow. He said he was trying to get into it. His mom was like, you're not doing this. You're going to college. They took the money from our neighborhood, from our style, and they sent his ass to Harvard. Mm. This motherfucker invented Fitbit. He's a fucking billionaire from hmm. us, from us. How many of our kids, how many of their kids are we going to keep doing this shit? Hmm. This is why I got the problem with fucking Clubhouse. Their kids are going to be billionaires now. And we're not. And we fucking built that shit. And the we same still on that motherfucker talking all day. Just arguing. Meek, Meek, you don't need to do this, Meek. You are more important to the culture than this. Fuck academics. Get, him, get his ass the fuck out. Like, we got to cut this shit out, man. We got to cut it out. We are making these people trillions of dollars. Trillions. Trillions with a T. This is not an exaggeration. Apple's valuation is a trillion dollars. Oh, yeah. And we and then y'all want to cry when somebody gets shot in the fucking street? Like I said, it's a direct line. Mm. It's a direct line. If we had all that money that Clubhouse and Fitbit and all that had, we can buy any politician that we want. And we could tell that politician, listen, you do what the fuck we tell you to do, or we ain't giving you no money. Your ass gonna be at the office. And guess what's gonna happen next time one of us get, get shot and killed? That politician gonna go on a huge campaign mm-hmm. to get that cop the fucking death penalty. And now you can't kill niggas no more. But y'all wanna fucking argue on Clubhouse. <laughs> Talk to him, my brother. Man. Hey, man, I've been enjoying this motherfucking. Yeah, hey, I already knew this was gonna be a special one, my dog. Hell yeah. Man.
Yeah, I, I, I got I got one last question, man. I gotta ask, man. I gotta I ask. Off, my brother. What, what's your why, my brother? What's what's making you do all of this? What's making you ticks? What's making you motivated? The stuff that I just said. Like I got I'm 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 fucking tired of it, man. I'm I'm tired of black people being so behind. We we've had a black president. So I'm going a little fast. There's three major indexes in the in the stock market: Nasdaq, Dow Jones, S and P 500. Mm -hmm. Standard and Poor's 500, named after some old white dudes. It's the top 500 companies essentially that represent the economy. If you bet on the S and P 500, you're betting on America. You put your money in an S and P 500 index fund every seven years. It's going to double. Like this is basic investment knowledge. We've had a black president, which is probably the hardest position to get. In, in all of society, only there's only been 46 people that have ever been president, and one of them has been black. We have never had a black-owned company in S&P 500. I don't want to be the greatest rapper of all time. I want to be the greatest entrepreneur of all time. The fact we have built this entire fucking country, and we never had a black-owned company in S&P 500. Can y'all name me one black-owned company that's public right now that we I buy in stock in like that? I can't. I can't. I can't. Thank you. Uh, Stop. You, you, you won. You, uh, what was the actual name? You won is the ticker. Um, that's RLJ. That's, that's Robert L. Johnson. Yep, but yep, yeah, yep. We, some, we some different niggas when it come to that respect. We actually Please. put out a blog on it. Please. Um, because we need that information. And, and I ain't gonna lie, that's one of my goals in my life. Like, I keep on telling them, bro, I'm gonna take a company public because I wanna see more black owned companies traded on the stock market. Got and to. that's one of my goals. I wanna be on one of these motherfucking index. It's only and three. I, wanna, I wanna be the reason why this motherfucker going up like Tesla. Got to, man. And and you know, Michelle Obama has, has a great quote. And she was like, I've been in a room with these people. They are not that damn smart. And when, and for real, like, these dudes who founded Kevin Seistrom and Instagram, and I'm not coming at them, but y'all y'all fit the fucking profile. Kevin Seistrom at Instagram, Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook, Evan Spiegel at Snapchat, you know, all these dudes, like they, they were intelligent dudes. But if you look at their background, their history, their parents, their grandparents gave them access because mm -hmm. they did all that stuff before. Our parents didn't know any better. We do. So y'all asking my why, I want my... I want my daughter to be a millionaire by the time that she's five years old. She's 19 months now. And I want when she's 18, if she want to fucking go to Paris for three years and fucking uh, make pots from her bare hands, she can do that because she got the fucking money. I don't want her to have to worry about money. And I'm tired of black people. Every time we have a problem, we got to vote for this person and we got to protest this. We got to do that. No, we need to pay for this shit. That's mm. the only language America understands. Racism has been going on forever. It wasn't until George Floyd got killed on tape and we started breaking shit and costing them money that they wanted to change shit all of a sudden. They don't understand nothing else. So my contribution to this is I have entrepreneurial gifts. I'm trying to acquire as much resources as I can. And for those of y'all that are following me, y'all going to be mad at me over the year for my political affiliations. Just know this. I'm bringing that money back to black people. I don't give a fuck. Republicans, Democrats, are you trying to get results or not? That's all that I care about. So that's my why. I want when I'm 80 years old, I'm like, okay, we ain't getting shot in the streets no more when we 16. That shit got to mm. stop, man. Real mm. shit. Ooh, man. Mm. I love it, my brother. It's heavy, but I love it because that's, that's some real shit, though, man. Some real shit. And I just want to say thank you. Thank yeah. you for coming on the pod, man. We enjoyed this, my brother. We knew it was going to be special. We was looking forward to this. Appreciate you for spending your Saturday afternoon with us, my dog. For sure. And Absolutely, Dorian. man. Y'all can follow me everywhere at Dorian Group 82 on all social media, group82music.com. And, and to, and, and to y'all, y'all need me to do anything, man. Post shit, share, whatever. Let me know. I'm down. You know what I mean? Once I come on a podcast, I want to see y'all succeed because y'all do really, really good, good, good stuff. It's a lot of it's a lot of our podcasts out here, but I'm very selective who I listen to. I listen to y'all, so I appreciate what y'all do. Hey, man. Appreciate, appreciate it, that, my, my brother. brother. I'm glad you gave the people your information because that's all I was about to ask them, man. But also, if you're an independent artist, y'all, please get at my brother. Y'all yeah. need his, his guidance. If y'all you listen to this episode and you ain't getting nothing out of this, you need to go fuck with Group 82 because mm. my brother is actually helping people get on in this shit. Hell yeah. Yeah. Appreciate y'all. Hey, it. and for everybody, once again, if y'all new here, 
thank y'all for listening to the whole podcast episode. We want to say thank y'all. Thank y'all. Thank y'all. Um, if you've been here, appreciate y'all too, man. Thank y'all for growing with us. Like I said, BWR to the moon. We're trying to hit 20,000 plays uh, first 60 days, first 30 days this year, y'all. So y'all help us out right now. That. Yeah, right now we had 10,000 plays in the first 30 days. Help us get to 20, y'all. We want y'all to make sure y'all share this. Share this with y'all family. Share this with y'all friends. Share this with anybody. Hey, and I don't care. Yeah, we, we, I'm on the street. Yeah, if, if, we, if we say Black Wealth Renaissance, but this is for everybody. Did we just do this for our culture? For facts. Um, yeah, I ain't really got nothing else, dog. On that, that, on that note, it's David with Black Wolf Renaissance signing out. Peace. I got money on my mind. I'm just trying to get some dough. I ain't picking up my lot unless it's money on the phone.